So, welcome, Andrew. This is our first call. <laughs> Second time we tried the video, so we'll go from, from there. Um, we started into talking about Western Buddhism and how some of the things that are missing in we could go actually one of the ways that I describe it is like the actual teachings of the Buddha are like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. And that we have to get a few pieces at a time and put that puzzle together. And when we get the puzzle together, we understand things completely. Mm -hmm. And that Western Buddhism is that same jigsaw puzzle with a couple of pieces gone. <laughs> There's an old song about that. Uh, Leroy Brown is like a junkyard dog with a couple of pieces. On. Right. OK, so this is what we're talking about. And the, the actual teachings of the Buddha are, are actually centralized around his one point that he said this in several suttas that he teaches only one thing, and that is Dukkha Dukkha Naroda. And yet the way that the Mahasi practice is, is Dukkha, look at Dukkha, inspect Dukkha, really get a load of Dukkha, mm -hmm. chase it down, beat it down, and really understand Dukkha. Yeah. Um, and with the choiceless awareness, that is, oh, there's the Dukkha. Well, there it is again. Well, there it is again. Okay. And neither one of these are the teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha taught Dukkha Dukkha Naroda. Mm -hmm. And when we say Dukkha Dukkha Naroda, we're not talking about a 30 year span of 25 years of Dukkha and five years of Dukkha Naroda. That's not the way that it's all set up. But rather, see the Dukkha right now and come out of the Dukkha right now. That's the real teaching of the Buddha and that we do this with the Eightfold Noble Path, and we do this with actually the Four Noble Truths, because the Four Noble Truths is nothing but the teaching of Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda, unpacked slightly. It's almost like that the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Noble Path is all folded up into, into one statement or one sentence. The entire teachings of the Buddha is Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda. But we can find other ways of giving the entire path. The one that I like is coming out of a, a reggae song called Don't Worry, Be Happy. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the whole show. That's the entire teaching. Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda is Don't Worry, Be Happy. Now, this Don't Worry means the second noble truth in the sense of what is the cause of suffering is worry. It's not the only one, but basically you could go so far as to say that's a kind of a bucket or a, 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 a sign for the whole thing. That basically uh, all of the suffering comes from a kind of worrying, finding things that are wrong, uh, and uh, having unwholesome thoughts that lead them to greed, ill will, and delusion. So one of the things about Western Buddhism, for most Westerners, it seems really, really complicated. We have two of this, and three of those, three of them things, three more of that, five of this, six of those, and eight of them things, twelve of this, sixteen of the stages of insight, are, 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 and sixteen stages of anapanasati, and it's all really Basically, it's a good idea then to uh, take it in the original teachings down to something that's very simple and pass that on to the students and then help them unpack that so that they can see all of the complexity because the complexity is not the teaching of the complexity of the mind. And that we use the teaching of the Buddha to unpack the mind and see all the complexities and, and sort of Teach it and and um, and whatnot like that. Um, that you could go so far as to say that um, that when a product comes out, later editions of that product sometimes are going to be more complicated and more um, 
sophisticated, but in other cases, it's going to be more simple and yet more sophisticated. An example of that would be like with the new Tesla automobiles, they're going to have the whole frame down to just one piece. Right now, in most automobiles, it's uh, uh, several thousand parts, mm-hmm. including bolts and washers and all kinds of things. And so um, the whole point, though, of a car, never mind how complex they are, they only really have one easy looking feature, and that is transportation. That's all they do. So that's what we're looking for here is uh, the only thing that we're going to get out of Buddhism is the transportation out of dissatisfaction and unwholesomeness into satisfaction and into wholesomeness. That's That's all. (laughs) Yet most of the people from the West, because of the tradition of Christianity and all kinds of other things, are expecting Buddhism to be so much more. Mm-hmm. That in fact they expect that if Buddhism is going to, um, let us say, compete with Christianity, it's got to be as big and grand and grandiose and out of sight as Christianity is in order to compete. Basically, we're talking about the difference between a marble and a boulder. And a marble is a whole lot easier to manage and carry around, and a boulder is rough and all of that kind of stuff as well as heavy. So if we can understand from the very beginning that the teachings of the Buddha is actually quite simple and there's not much to it, that means that then much of the time that you and I spend in relationship with each other is a friendly jog through a vast territory of mentality Mm -hmm. and start applying these very, very simple rules to it to straighten the whole thing out. And so this is the way that we look at it, that the, um, the, the basic teaching of Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda, then unpacks into uh, the Four Noble Truths, which needs some time to um, express them, because a lot of people have the idea that life itself is dissatisfying, that, that life is Dukkha. We can get that in the sense that many Christians have the idea that, oh, this life is just a waiting station, that the real thing happens after you're dead. All right. What that tends to uh, have that general mentality is is that this life is not worth anything. And yet the reality of the situation would be that if I would hold a gun to your head and give you two choices, you can either die in this minute or you can wait 10 minutes and then die. Which would you choose? The latter. (laughs) All right. So that proves then that, that you would rather keep your life, that life itself is precious. And yet a whole lot of teachings have to do with this life is not precious that you're going to have another life that's going to be better than that some some other time. And so this whole idea of life after death that is also similar to a teaching in Hinduism about reincarnation sounds very delicious to the ordinary person who finds this life full of suffering and they would like to have a life that has that's free from that suffering. Well, This, the teaching of the Buddha is, yes, let's do that right now. Let's do it right now and do it again and do it again and do it again. But the real issue, though, is is that this dissatisfaction has a cause. It's got a source. There's got reasons behind it, but it's not life itself that is dukkha. That in fact, uh, the word dukkha itself is badly translated. One of the bigger problems with modern Western Buddhism is the bad translations of what the Buddha actually was saying has been bent by words and by culture and by all kinds of things, including a whole lot of people when they actually understand the teachings of the Buddha, they don't like it at all because they can't make a profit off of it. The preacher man can say, oh, give me all your money and I'll help you get into heaven. But uh, the Buddhist teachers 
don't really need any money because they're already happy. You, you can see that, in fact, the preacher man is still in a kind of hell that has not enough money in it. So he wants your money. So at least the preacher at the church is smarter than most of the uh, parishioners. That the wise people who would come to, uh, uh, to church would be like Homer Simpson and take money out of the plate rather than put it in. <laughs> And so this whole idea then that the cause of suffering is not something magical and mystical. Uh, it's not a preview of the religions or anything, but in fact, uh, what makes a religion is wrong answers to wrong questions. And so speculations, uh, the speculated answers about speculated questions is why we go down these rabbit holes. And, and one of the reasons why we will go down a certain rabbit hole um, is that the rabbit hole is falsely labeled because of a bad translation. And so you can see how Christianity had a major influence on Buddhism right from the very beginning because the worst word, the first word of Buddhism is wrongly translated into the word suffering. But in fact, you and I can sit here and kind of agree that right now we're not suffering. That in fact, most if you had a, um, a Jehovah's Witness style Buddhism where they carried tracks and knocked on people's doors and asked, are you suffering? Nobody will say I'm suffering. Couldn't give a track to anybody. I can solve your suffering. Well, I'm not suffering. But if you ask the question, are you ever dissatisfied? Now, the, the answer is yes. Yes, I'm dissatisfied often, but I'm not suffering. I'm just dissatisfied. Well, this is what the Buddha is actually looking at, is that dissatisfaction. But a lot of Westerners think that they're trying to eliminate suffering, something really, really big. Or in fact, no, we're just looking for the little stuff. Okay, this is an important point. Now, what is the cause of this suffering? Is actually stuff that we're doing, that we cause the suffering. We do it. We cause the dissatisfaction and we do it by wanting things that we don't have or uh, putting not wanting to put up with things that we find hard to put up with. Which is normally called greed, ill will and delusion. Now in the Mahayana, they've gone so far as to change that into it's done by clinging, but clinging is a bit different. The clinging is full blown to where the original point was that we wanted something that we didn't have. And and the reason that that's true, and this has been true throughout human history, that we want something and then we go get it, thinking that if we get what we want, the feeling of want goes away. But it doesn't. That the, If we want something and we get it, then that feeling of wanting will just be uh, placed onto something else until we get that. And then we want something else. Not only that, but once we get something, it's probably going to fall apart. And now we're subject to grief over the loss of that which we thought was me. So the, and so that loss is often um, uh, met with ill will and anger over the loss of something. That was going to be lost anyway, because everything is temporary. Everything is temporary, and so anything that we get in order to feel good, we're going to lose that and then go back and feel bad again. Right. That sequence, we don't see it. And because we don't see it, we act ignorantly, and often we even act out of delusion in the sense that we think we know what's right when in fact we are completely wrong. That we're, we're mistaken, but we cling to the mistake. It's very interesting that when uh, two people get in an argument, generally the case is, is that they're arguing over something that neither one of them have absolute knowledge and proof over. An example of that is when two guys are fighting over whose sports team or whose athlete is better, because the criteria for how we select who is better is changing. In other words, I can, I can uh, set up the criteria 
so that this sport team wins my heart and the criteria over here I can set up so that this sport team wins my heart. So now you've got two different people with two different criteria going in and saying my sport team is better than yours and they get into a great big argument. All right. Someone who is completely disinterested in sports is unlikely to get into that argument. All right. It's also possible that maybe one of the um, uh, uh, the w owners of one of the star teams just happens to be in the same bar where this argument is happening. It's unlikely because of his deep knowledge and understanding, he's not going to get into that argument. There's just a couple of fools over there arguing. Okay, so what I'm getting at is, is that direct knowledge, deep knowledge, doesn't argue. It's only people who are in doubt will argue with each other. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the ignorance then. The ignorance is what helps create the ill will. When you know something is true, there's no arguing about it. It's just there it is. Now the question is, do you like it or not? And if it doesn't matter, then everything is good. But when we're unsure, we wind up in arguments trying to find out. And so this ignorance, uh, which leads to doubt, is one of the issues of the cause of suffering as our cause of dukkha, as well as the issue of because we're ignorant about our greed, our greed then is created by ignorance. Our ill will is created by ignorance and our doubts are created by ignorance. And so if we really begin to see what's going on, we're going to get an advantage here. And this is what the Mahasi method was originally all about is really look at what's going on. Okay, so this is the second noble truth. The third noble truth is almost never mentioned, never talked about because they don't really understand what it is. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't understand where you're going, the likelihood of you winding up there is kind of remote. Right? Mm -hmm. If you don't know where you're going, then you, even if you get where you're going, you won't know that because you didn't recognize where you were going in the first place. Okay. And so it's kind of important for the student to begin to understand what this third noble truth is, and that is just to get yourself into a state of satisfaction as opposed to being in a state of unsatisfying. We find something that's satisfying. And this is not done for years and years later. You'll find many, many people with the idea that one thing they'll say is, is that, oh, there haven't been enlightened beings for centuries. We've got to go figure it all out because there's no teachers left. They've all died. That's one of the ways that they say it. Uh, another one is, uh, uh, and this is basically the idea of pragmatic Buddhism, is, is that there's got to be a pony in that uh, set of suttas someplace. You can only figure it out. What they don't understand is, is that in Asia, they've known it for centuries. They already have figured it out. But it hasn't translated well into Western Buddhism yet. So, and part of the problem is translations, but the bigger problem is, is that all of the teachers who are teaching English and teaching from the West never got the real training that they needed in the first place. Most of the really famous ones only spent a year or two in the robes, only a year or two in Burma. They couldn't stand it, but they liked the Dhamma enough to come back and want to build a whole career over it, but they did so with more of their Western influence than they did in the Asian influence. So um, the whole point about the third noble truth is to practice meditation to get ourselves into a state of satisfaction rather than being always dissatisfied. Now, there's a method of getting oneself into a state of satisfaction, and that is the Eightfold Noble Path with its supports and um, uh, re requirements and, and features. Now, a lot of people start off Buddhism 
with the uh, the three points of Shiva Samati Panya. Have you ever heard of Shiva Samati Panya? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what ordinary people practice. We teach Sila even in uh, in Thailand to the children. The Sila is the morality. Okay, and they say in some places, in some organizations, uh, they say, oh, if you're going to practice this way, then that means that you have to spend five or 10 years as a monk just watching your behavior. And when you get your behavior purified, then you can go and practice some samadhi. And you do that for another 10 or 20 years. And when you get that done, then you can practice purification of view. But that's not the way that the Buddha taught. No, they're taught one, two, three. The first thing you do is you get into seclusion. Because if you're not around other people, if you're sitting there quietly wherever you are with your eyes closed and your legs folded and your hands folded and you're doing nothing, then your your sila right then and there is perfect enough. So getting away from it all and getting into seclusion, that's the easy way of getting your sila perfect. Except for one thing, it's really difficult to be uh, pure in sila if you're sitting there on the floor in the meditation hall planning to rob the bank <laughs> or planning to stab the teacher in the back or planning to do this and that or the other thing. And so the uh, a deeper purification of that sila would be then the purification of the mind itself, which is the whole point. So we get away from it all so that we can get secluded enough to get away from it all. Another way of talking about it is, is that we bring uh, the world with us, that when we go into seclusion, we get away from the world only to find out that in that process, we brought the world with us. Sort of like I want to get away from all my baggage, and so I pack my bags and take them and leave. But still, so got all my baggage. I brought it with me. <laughs> I brought my suitcases, my backpacks, and all of that kind of stuff. So... The Eightfold Noble Path basically has some supports to it that need to be investigated and uh, understood. And the first one, in fact, is investigation. That one's right view uh, often, in fact, I've made the mistake when I was reading the suttas, I was saying, okay, well, I know what wrong view is and I know what ordinary right view is, but what is noble right view? And there's no noble right view there. What it is, is instead an investigation that role, that noble right view is not a viewpoint, it's a viewing. That's another bad translation. Okay. That, it's, that actually the word that, that would be better would be investigation rather than holding views. Right. Holding views is a concept, okay? conceptualized mind, that basically what the conceptualized mind or concepts is, is that we create an imaginary world and think that it's real. That's what a concept is. And that what we're practicing is is to stop those concepts and come into reality right here, right now. So coming out of the conceptualized mind, and yet the uh, Mahasi method promotes conceptualizations. And so what we're going to do is practice a little differently by practicing actually the Eightfold Noble Path. And that uh, starts off with an investigation. But how do you get an investigation even started? In other words, when are you going to look? The answer is whenever you remember to look. That that sati, you have to remember to come back and be here now. You have to remember to be able to do it. Then we do the investigation. So now we've got two aspects of the Eightfold Noble Path. You have to remember to look. And then you have to look. But this looking is an investigation. It's sort of like, um, you know the story about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? Uh, sure, yeah, I mean, I know. Yeah, you've heard about them. You, yeah. you know about them? Okay, so 
there you find Sherlock Holmes with his magnifying glass out inspecting every little thing in the room, in the crime scene, to where Dr. Watson is musing over who used to live there and what kind of lifestyle they had like that. And he's absolutely completely flabbergasted that, um, that Sherlock Holmes can get all this information by actually investigating and actually looking rather than musing over what's the possibilities. And this is what we're uh, practicing here is the actual investigation of the evidence of a crime scene. Our own crime scene. <laughs> What is that crime scene? Well, the crime is, the, the result of the crime is dissatisfaction. They were not satisfied. There must have been something that happened, whatever it was, we need to go find out what that was. But in this sense, once we see what the problem is immediately, now we have to take the next step in the April Noble Path, and that's right effort. That's the key ingredient that's missing in so many of the Western Buddhism's practices is the right effort. And what is one's right effort is to remove unwholesome thoughts from the mind immediately and substitute them with wholesome thoughts. That this teaching of the Buddha is all over the suttas. There is a sutta that is called, it's number 19 in the Majjhima Nikaya, and the name of it is Two Kinds of Thoughts. There are thoughts that are harmful, thoughts that are unwholesome, thoughts that are agitating, and then there are thoughts that are calming, peaceful, and happy. And we are not taught those the distinction between that two kinds of thinking as children, because all of the people that we were raised with don't know the difference between wholesome and unwholesome thoughts. And so that's not taught in our schools. We're taught how to read, but we're not taught how to think. We're taught how to manipulate computers, but we're never taught how to manipulate our own mind. So. Here's where we're going with this is, is that one's right effort means that we inspect the kind of thought that we have and then change it to a better thought, to a more wholesome thought. This is what's missing in both the Mahayana and the uh, Mahasi method. Because they're both looking at investigation. The example that I would use is imagine that you're standing on a highway and a big truck is barreling down on you. Here it comes, maybe even honking his horn. This is my lane, I'm here, get out of my way. There's three ways to, uh, to handle that big truck coming down the road. One is to do it the, um, the way that many meditators do, and that is they're trying to force the mind or to stop the mind or to do something with the mind. And that's very much like Popeye the sailor man with a can of spinach standing in front of that uh, truck trying to stop it with his fist. And guess what? He gets run over. The other guy is the choiceless awareness. He sees the truck coming, but he lets it hit him anyway. <laughs> right. So here's an interesting point about that, and that is, is that if you see the truck and you get all uptight because it's about to hit you, and then it hits you, now you've got two troubles, getting uptight and it hit you. Wouldn't it have been better to not see it at all and just let it run over you? <laughs> all right. Well, this is one of the ways that people practice meditation is, is that they're, they're worse off by practicing meditation because they can see the stuff before it hits them and then it hits them. Right. This is what leads into those higher stages in the 16 stages of insight of misery, fear, disgust, despair, that is often, and also the strong desire to get out of that state, which in Western Buddhism is referred to as a dark night of the soul, a really, really heavy duty downer. Yes, I am right? <laughs> Well, guess what? The Buddha's teaching is known to be good in the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end when it's taught correctly with the right phrases and meanings. So where does this dark night of the soul for the middle ray uh, or the, uh, the middle 
practitioner. He starts off, he learns the meditation, and then things get worse. Something's not fitting correctly here. And this and where this is, is because the student's not taking the right effort once he sees the dukkha to throw it out right now, to get rid of it right this very instant, and then come to practice correctly. Now, in the, um, the sutta that is a great exposition on the Eightfold Noble Path, right view and right effort, especially, are discussed this way. That you have to see and evaluate, is this thought wholesome or not? And if it's unwholesome, to move, remove it. This is also referred to in the very fa favorite sutta of the Mahasya method, which is uh, sutta number 10, the Satipatthana Sutta, where um, the, the four foundations of mindfulness are laid out, body, feeling, mind, mind's objects. Uh, but in, in the mind's objects part of that sutta, it very specifically spells out the hindrances as something to be removed that in fact in this sutta it has several things in that last part the dhamma nupassana section first is the hindrances are to be removed and then we look at the five aggregates the seven factors of enlightenment and the four noble truths in the sense of this is what we should be paying attention to something that's wholesome but we have to remove the unwholesome first and this is something that's missing in the Western Buddhism about these hindrances. They know that they're near and they know that they need to be removed, but they're not looking for them to remove them when they come up. They just have the idea that, oh, someday I should remove the hindrances. Or if one, if one hindrance comes up that's big enough that I can see it easily, then I'll remove it. But really what we're talking about is an investigation or a search that we're actually intending to find these hindrances so that we can remove them. That's the, the, the distinction that's missing. Also, in there's many places in these suttas where the hindrances are mentioned. But in uh, one sutta in particular, it talks about Sariputta's path. And it says in the beginning, right there, when it starts off, it says the first thing to do is is to clean the mind so that you are free from unwholesome states. And now we begin the practice. The actual practice of Anapanasati or the actual practice of the Mahasi method of noting, the noting should be done after the mind is free from hindrances, not while you're doing the hindrances. What we need to do is to note the hindrances only enough to see that this is a hindrance and then out it goes. Let's not dwell on it. Let's not inspect it. Let's not figure it out. Let's just throw it out. That's the difference in the way that the Buddha actually taught is that we need to remove these hindrances as soon as they're caught rather than played with as a toy. I mean, once you recognize that this is a pile of shit, why rub it all over yourself? <laughs> Better just to throw it down and wash your hands and be rid of it. So. Um, in the Anapanasati Sutta, it takes it one step a little further than that. And that is that um, the point of uh, gladdening the mind, that not only just to remove the unwholesome thoughts and put in wholesome thoughts, but we want to intentionally brighten the mind, gladden the mind with the kinds of thoughts that we have. That basically what we're saying is, is that you have spent your whole life into talking yourself into feeling bad. Now is time to talk yourself into feeling good. This is what brightening the mind and gladdening the mind is all about. But let's not dwell on the hindrance. Let's not dwell in the dukkha. Let's not inspect the stuff. Let's throw it out and get something much more wholesome, much more better. That's the way that we're practicing now is, is to start gladdening the mind, having only wholesome thoughts in the mind. So let us look for a bit and do some investigation of what 
thoughts then are going to be completely wholesome? What kind of thoughts are obviously completely unwholesome? And then what kind of thoughts are there that's in a gray area that we need to do a little bit more work on? Okay. So there are some kind of thoughts that is fairly easy. In fact, we can go to those by just looking at the precepts, thoughts of harming people, thoughts of taking things, thoughts of belittling other people, thoughts of um, uh, greed, thoughts of I'm not good enough, thoughts of victimization, thoughts of um, I need help, I need Jesus as a savior, I'm not good enough by myself. Okay, these are the kinds of thoughts. Uh, I need a doctor, I need a lawyer, I need a mommy, I need a God, I need a Jesus, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. Those are all unwholesome thoughts. A much more wholesome thought then would be, I don't need anything. I'm okay as I am. There's no place to go and nothing to do and everything is easy. I'm already enlightened. I don't need anything. You see, much of what you will find in Western Buddhism is Westerners coming to Buddhism doing the same thing that they've been doing all along, and that is wanting something that they don't have. And now they're come to Buddhism to want something from Buddhism that they don't have. And many of them put some labels on that. Oh, I want to be soda pond. Oh, I want to be arahat. Oh, I want to have past life experiences. Oh, I want nibbana. Oh, I want enlightenment. You know, all of this kind of I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. And so they take all of this into the meditation, wanting stuff, sitting there in unsatisfying place because they want something that they don't have. What's much better is, is to recognize that what you do have is adequate enough. I mean, here you are, you survived up to this point. You must have been doing something right. You lived, you stayed, I mean, you're still breathing. <laughs> Why don't we congratulate ourselves for at least making it this far? Instead of finding out all the problems that we had along the way. Oh, I almost didn't make it that time and I almost didn't make it this time. Instead of worrying about what the problems of the past, let's just take a new view of it that never mind even the future. Let's just be okay right now. Let's gladden the mind. Let's have some wholesome thoughts. Wholesome thoughts would be everything's okay. Everything is fine. No worries, no problems, no place to go, nothing to do. Everything is satisfying. Everything is all right. We don't have to say everything is perfect because who needs perfection? That's something that doesn't exist. When people want perfection, they're just wanting something they don't have. We're not talking about getting perfection or getting it all. We're talking about getting enough. Just enough, just a little dab of satisfaction will do you. We can also have thoughts about I'm, things are not dangerous. You know, we live in a society that is built upon danger and avoidance of danger. This is why people want a gun is because they feel insecure and unsafe. This is why people want an education. They feel unsure, unsafe and insecure. This is why the teenage boy wants a car. He wants freedom. He wants transportation. He feels unsafe and insecure under daddy's thumb. He wants his own car. And so this is all issued. Now, here's the thing. 100, 200,000 years ago, we lived in the jungle, and the jungle actually was dangerous. We needed to deal with danger, and sometimes even now we need to deal with danger. That in fact, your, uh, the feeling of danger comes out of the self-preservation instinct. It's an instinctual inbred programming that comes in with our DNA, and that's kept you alive up until today. Your fear. You know, they, they have phrases like, uh, um, uh, the fool goes where angels fear to tread, right? So that means that if angels are afraid to go there, then they survive. The fool, he feels no fear, he gets dead. 
So we have to pay attention to the fear. It's actually a useful tool for us. But the big problem is, is that uh, in our society, most of the fear that we have is conceptualized fear that is not really a dangerous animal in front of us. It's just something that we imagine or that we've been told is dangerous. And so we go around with a whole lot of self, uh, let, uh, excuse me, false positives. We have false positives of fear that we feel fear when there's no reason to feel fear. We're just in the habit of having a thought and then bringing up fear. We think about the bully that beat us up one time and now we have the feeling of fear, the same as we did when the bully beat us up. Okay, but there's no reason for that. That's just ignorance that we wind up feeling the way that we used to feel when we think about something that happened before. To where right now, there's no danger. I mean, look at the room that you're in. Right now, there's absolutely no neighbors anywhere. There's no alligators on the floor. There's no crocodiles. You don't have a tarantula on your keyboard. There's no rattlesnakes on your bed. There's no mafia. There's no SWAT team breaking in. Why is it that we go around feeling afraid when in fact there's no dangers? The answer is, is that that's taught and built into our society. That in fact it's instinctual to feel fear, but we feel so many false fears because of the society is making all of these rules and whatnot. So when we're sitting down and practicing meditation, what that actually should be is, is that we're actually practicing developing the skills of being satisfied, content, and safe. So a wholesome thought would be telling yourself that you're safe right now. Everything's okay right now. There's no dangers. Now contrast that to thinking about an email that you've got to write to the boss, or maybe uh, a letter you've got to write, or maybe a bill that you've got to pay. And as soon as you think of that bill, how do you feel? You feel like you got to go do something, right? Right. right. That's and, and the the underlying feeling about that is is that something will go wrong if I don't pay that bill. Therefore, I choose right now to feel afraid about that bill. It's almost as if I don't feel afraid of that bill. I won't write the bill. I won't pay the bill, and then I'll have to suffer. Yeah, like I understand that to extent when it's about like thoughts, but what what about when it when it uh, the source of the dissatisfaction like it seems more physiological, like uh... right? But that's going too deep and it's missing your target. Okay. okay, don't go there. Go to this particular moment, the unwholesome thought, uh -huh. and remove that. If you keep removing the thought over and over again, the analogy is imagine that you've got sidewalk, regular sidewalk pavement that's got a crack in it and a weed is growing up in that crack. All right. Now, if you um, you can't pull the weed out, but you and also you can't dig it up. Because if you dig it up, you'll destroy the sidewalk. You're doing more damage than the weed itself. It'll take the weed years to, build, to destroy that sidewalk. And you wanted to get rid of the weed will destroy the sidewalk to get rid of the weed. They found that out in Vietnam. You have to destroy a village to save it. But there's another way. And that is, is just um, when the weed grows big enough to put a leaf up, then all we need to do is to cut that leaf off, just to throw this to cut that shoot off. If you keep cutting that shoot off over and over again, then the uh, uh, weed gets no daylight, it gets no sun, it gets no nourishment, and eventually the root of the weed will die out. But for quite a while, the leaf is going to keep coming up, and the only thing you have to do is to whack that lead off as soon as you see it. That's the teaching of the Buddha, the Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda. When the Dukkha comes up, you cut it out right then, never mind what the root of it was. And you will never see the root of it, but we will eventually see that that plant is no longer, that weed is no longer sending up shoots. 
so, it's, so it seems like sort of the essential difference is rather than just like noticing the dukkha when it arises and like examining it, it's like noticing it and then doing and cutting it off yeah. right then and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way to do it. Rather than if somebody insults you, instead of mulling over the insult and feeling bad and trying to wiggle your way out of it, the easy thing to say is, ah, he can't touch me. That's nothing. And just throw it away. It's, right. it's just it's not important. Yeah, somebody insults you. Just so what? You don't have to learn anything from that. You don't have to feel bad. You don't have to fit in with society. You can just ignore it. Throw it out. Send him some loving kindness instead if you've got some loving kindness. But most people won't throw that stuff out. And so any method that they try to do is going to be tinged with their own ill will for the guy who criticized them. Right. But we just throw it out. It's not. It doesn't matter. It's not important. It's, it's no big deal. And even a better thing, because we're leading to this, and that criticism can't touch me. You, you've heard that song. I think it's by Jay Z or somebody. You know, da 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 da. You can't touch me. <laughs> All right. So this is the attitude that we're getting up, but this is an important point about attitude, and that is, is that when we're practicing right uh, view or right viewing, right investigation along with right shanti and the right effort of taking these unwholesome thoughts one after another and throwing them out, throwing them out, throwing them out over and over and over again, we begin to gain a fourth ingredient, and that is Sama Sankapa in the Pali, and that is right noble attitude. The right noble attitude is to be above the world, the super mundane, or in the Pali is Lokatara, to get above it all. Can't touch me. Uh, or a, another way, and a, perhaps an easier and more um, rudimentary way of understanding it is from the position of, aha, I see that, and that leads to, aha, I can handle that. So eventually the student gets to the point is, no matter how obstructed the mind is, no matter how tough the situation is, I can throw the hindrances out of the mind and deal with this situation with reality, with um, uh, skill, uh, and uh, with aloofness. Um, possibly a very heavy duty example of that is getting stopped by the police. I mean, here you are tooling down the road and, and you see in the rearview mirror, in fact, all over the car is the red and blue flashing lights and followed by the siren. So when that happens, how do you feel? Anxious. <laughs> huh? Uh, anxious. <laughs> All right. So if you feel anxious before the cop even gets to the window, how are you going to feel when he gets when he's standing here in the window knocking and you say, roll your window down with great authority? Sure. Going to freak out a little bit more, huh? That's how people get killed is because they're afraid of the cops. They act afraid when they are afraid the cop picks up on the fear. So he puts his hand on the gun. And then more fear. And so somebody goes to get their papers and the cop thinks that they're going after a weapon and then they use them. They're dead because they were afraid. But if you've got the presence of mind, if you can uh, say, I'm going to be able to handle this really well when the cop comes. OK, I can see he's stopping me now. I'm, and as I'm pulling over, I'm saying I can handle this. There's no problems here. Everything's going to be all right. And so you get yourself into a good state. And then when you uh, the police, when you roll down the police, you can say, hi, officer, I'm really glad that you guys are out doing your duty tonight. I've heard such good things about you. And I, I want to make sure that you know that uh, I'm here to help and support you. What can I do for you, officer? Now, with that attitude. It's likely you might not even get a ticket. That you're praising him. You don't admit to any wrongdoing. What you admit to is how friendly you are and how uh, joyful you are to see him. No, officer, I didn't know I was doing anything wrong at all. I'm just going down the highway the way that uh, you would expect us to go down the highway. Not breaking any laws, but I really am glad to see you. Glad to see you guys out. I know that you will uh, make the road safe 
thank you. How many people have that attitude with the cops? Very few. <laughs> All right. Well, in that regard, that means that you're at an advantage because you have some wisdom going here only if you can wake up when those lights are flashing. So this is the point about it. This is where the skill comes in, is to recognize the unwholesome thoughts and to throw them out and replace them with wholesome, friendly, happy thoughts. Over and over and over again, we need to do this. Every time that weed comes up to the surface, we whack it off. We remove that unwholesome thought. This is the real teaching of the Buddha, and it's right there in the poor noble uh, truths and the Eightfold Noble Path. But it's the Western's misunderstanding of this that is the reason why people are not gaining the kind of success out of the practice that they could gain, or that it takes them years to do it, rather than just taking a couple of weeks, just practicing intensely for a couple of weeks, and you can clean your mind out. Right. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. Like Even like listening to this, I can sort of feel my my mind like wrestling with like the thing that it wants which is to be free of like physical discomfort and it's like oh but i can't enjoy. but then yeah as as you say this i'm seeing how like there's so many attitudes and like ideas and stories around that that i could start dealing with right now that are muddying the waters of like whatever the actual physiological thing that's arising is mm-hmm so that's a that's an example right there of a policeman with his red lights would be body pain. Yeah. OK, how are we going to handle that body pain? Well, we can do that. Oh, poor me. This is killing me. I don't think I'll uh, last the day. Mm-hmm. Or you can have the attitude. Oh, this is nothing. We can take care of this. Yeah. But we have to investigate it first to see what it is. Most people just feel the pain and then they either go in one direction or the other. Really, what we need to do is just to look at it, to investigate it, yeah. to find out that this is merely a surface sensation or is this something deep? And when we understand what is what's going on, now we can make choices wisely about it. Right. So the first thing is, is that ordinary pain, you can handle that. You've been handling pain your whole life and you survived. You can handle this next little pain. It's no big deal. You're a bigger man than that little pain. That pain is only about an inch long. Yeah. You've got a strong mind. I can handle that. You see, that's a different kind of mentality rather than, oh, poor me, how I can get rid of this pain. Oh, the pain is bigger than I am. Oh, I need help to get out of this pain. And uh, that's the loser's attitude. That's uh, yeah. the victim's attitude. The winner's attitude of can't touch me. Yeah, that pain is there, but it's OK. I can handle it got this wired. I can look at that pain the way that it really is. And in fact, uh, Goenka teaches it in the realm of that it's not really a pain at all. It's merely a sensation we don't like. And the intensity of the pain is more the intensity of the not liking it. That the suffering or the yeah. dukkha or the dissatisfaction is because we're calling it pain because we don't like it when merely it's nothing but a sensation. But normally, there's some, uh, many kinds of pains and sensations that we have would be like a mosquito bite. But we, we don't even know about the mosquito bite, but we do subconsciously, and so we will scratch that mosquito bite without actually investigating and inspecting it. Right. That a much better way of handling that mosquito bite is by looking at it, inspecting it, see what it is, and then nourish it with some medication. You take a bomb and you put it on and you rub it gently. Everything's going to be okay. This, this mosquito bites nothing. As opposed to the ripping of the skin with the fingernails. I don't like this mosquito bite. It's painful. Yeah. And then by the fingers, we're actually opening the skin, exposing it to bacteria as well as the, uh, the poison that the mosquito put in there. That can get infected if we're scratching it, get a big well points. But in fact, if it's just a regular mosquito bite that we've, we've uh, put some tiger bomb or nourished or do something with it, it's nothing. 
that in fact is uh, I could go so far as to say that I know about uh, uh, wrong who have left Thailand because they don't like the mosquitoes. Well, why is it that all of the people of Thailand don't leave Thailand because of the mosquitoes? The answer is someplace along the line, we learn to deal with mosquitoes happily. We know they're there, and so we light mosquito coils in the evening time because we know they're there. We're paying attention to what's going on. Right. So, so even when the, the habit is like very ingrained to like, to, yeah, to hate it or to be angry, like still the, the solution is just to start that investigation. And... Ah, so that means that mosquitoes become our teachers. Yeah. Yeah, the mosquitoes become our teachers because just like that cop can become our teacher. Oh, I can handle this cop. I don't have to scratch him because I don't like him. So that's the, uh, the way to begin to understand is, is that we need to change the content of the mind immediately. Right. As soon as we wake up and as soon as we see what's going on and change the mind from the unwholesome back into the wholesome, to begin to gladden the mind, to have wholesome thoughts, the wholesome thought, I can take care of this. I'm bigger than this. There's really nothing to be done. I'm fine already. Everything is okay. Everything is fine. No worries, mate. Nothing to do. No place to go. And everything's going to be all right. So, and so then, what, what, what is, it's like, Sometimes, like, I feel like I've tried that where it's like, oh, I'm fine. Like, there's no problem. I can handle this sensation. And I tell myself that. And it's not for a moment. One time. Like, yeah. But then one, it becomes one like, time. Yeah. Right. So it's just continu continuing to do that even. Right. Exactly. That's the whole point is over and over again. You can't whack that lead, weed, weed off. And then the next time it grows back, you have to, you then say, shit, I told you one time. Yeah. I destroyed you one time. And here you are again. Oh, poor me. Right. No, we just whack it off again and whack it off again and whack it off again. Right. This is the repetitive quality of it. Yeah, that we it. begin to develop the habit of being able to happily whack off the unwholesome it's, rather yeah, than dwelling on it. It's sneaky. It's so easy to like make a story or a generalization. It's like, oh, I thought it was fine and it wasn't. So now I believe that I can't do it rather than that I just need to keep at it. Exactly. So you've actually talked yourself into it's not fine when in fact you, the words you were using is that it's yeah. fine. <laughs> All right. So that's another layer that we look at that in fact everything really is okay. That we have to actually practice satisfaction. Okay. So we have to find a little bit of satisfaction and then practice that. When I would tell the students to practice it in joy, they would say, well, I do have joy, but it's not enough. Or I, t I tell myself to be joyful, but I don't feel it. Okay, these are both the uh, hindrances in the sense that what we're looking for is gladdening the mind to the point that we do feel satisfied. We have to actually generate that satisfaction. We have to generate it with the feeling of safety. Everything right now is safe. I don't have to go any place right now. I can just sit here and work this out. All right, and so we have to be safe. We also have to be comfortable. One of the things that I see in Western Buddhism is they get all competitive and everything because the idea is, is that once you relax and you have no place to go, you can just sit there with no place to go and nothing to do and everything is cool. And the Western comes in and sees the guy who does that. And he says, competition time. I can sit just as long as you can. Right. And now the meditator is sitting there in discomfort. And he wants out of it. He wants to go away. He doesn't want to sit there in pain. He wants to get rid of the pain. Well, what he's doing now is he's practicing wrong. He's actually creating the discomfort rather than finding ways to get out of discomfort. That if you can't sit for long periods of time, then sit for short periods of time and be happy. It's better to have two five minute happy sessions than 10 minutes of misery. Right. And so long sitting practices, sitting times of an hour or so, that's um, a, a hindrance for most Westerners. Right. 
So it's much better to practice correctly for shorter periods of time so long as we're maintaining being comfortable. To maintain, because you're, if you are uncomfortable, that itself is unsatisfactory. Right. But being comfortable, that would be an element of being satisfied. So remaining comfortable, remaining safe, secure, content, comfortable, will bring on a state of satisfaction. Everything is okay now. Everything is fine. Not a problem in the world. Now, as we practice that over and over and over again, that satisfaction begins to grow. And it grows into this samasankapa, the right attitude of, wow, I can do this. This stuff is good stuff, and I can do it. Yeah. Gaining confidence, or the Pali word is shraddha, which is not is translated wrongly as faith. There's no faith in this at all. This is all investigation, experimentation, and building upon one success after another. Yeah. No, I, yeah, there's, I'm getting a lot to to play with out of this because I feel like the, the mind has sort of started to move in that direction like just from sort of the process of like getting tired of like a subject but this seems like a much more proactive way of like oh no I can actually practice that I don't have to wait to like get bored of exactly. it you know? <laughs> isn't that funny the way that the western mind is is that they say all things are, are bad now but if things get really bad then I'll learn something in other words, this is the whole concept of hitting rock bottom. This is what that dark night of the soul is, is for the meditation student to have to hit rock bottom before he actually starts practicing correctly, where the right way to do it is start practicing correctly right from the very beginning when your dukkha is still small. Get rid of it when it's small rather than having it overwhelming before you can deal with it. One little leap at a time. You don't have to let that weed grow to an entire jungle. Just one one little leap comes up, this thought, and then whack it off, and we're okay. One thought at a time is unwholesome, is removed. So there's there's more to it than this, but I think that this is a good time to, uh, to relax, to stop, and to uh, collect things. Um, and that we can continue on with this. There's a lot of stories and a lot of ways of looking at it. But basically, the entire teaching of the Buddha is wrapped up in this four noble truths, in this eightfold noble path of right view, right sati, right effort, and right attitude. These things, those four together, bring about area sama, uh, sama area samati. Now, this word samati is always in English translated into concentration, the word concentration, and by doing so, we miss the point. This is another major, major issue within Western Buddhism and the English language version is, is that they misunderstand the word samati because the word samati actually means gathering together the appropriate factors. And this samadhi actually is ancient teaching of um, uh, systems theory. Have you ever heard of general systems theory? Yep. General systems theory has a lot of bits and pieces. It's, very, it's actually scientific. That's why they call it a, a theory. General systems theory has various postulates. The one that we're looking at is the issue that a system is uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts in a system okay that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts so an example of that would be you could have the uh, car parts spread all over your yard sure. <laughs> and you got no car there you've just got car parts it's only when the car parts come together in the appropriate fashion so they become a system and then something new is added what is that? Transportation. The car parts alone have no transportation. It's only when they're integral together that there's transportation. Another example of that would be a grandfather clock. That a grandfather clock, when it is put together with the gears in the right places, uh, all the right teeth, all of the dust, and, and everything is oiled correctly and all of that, 
then the result of that is that the clock ticks and talks in a way that we, with the hand movement, we say we can tell time. Right. But if you want to concentrate that clock, you're going to take a sledgehammer to it. And now you've got the clock very small, but it doesn't function anymore. Uh-huh. Okay. This is how Western meditation operates. They think that they need to concentrate the mind. And in fact, what we need to do is to lubricate and clean the mind and let it operate correctly rather than concentrating it. So that whole idea then of area samati, um, uh, sama area samati, is, is that the mind becomes fit for work. It becomes organized. It's got all of the constituent components that it needs that's come from right view, right sati, right effort, and right attitude. We bring those together and we have an organized mind. That mind is organized and unified because it doesn't want anything. If it wants something, then it's not whole yet. But if it doesn't want anything, then it's whole. Also, if we lie, that means that we're separating ourselves from the truth. There's a crowd in there again. Also, if you have an internal dialogue, you ought to do this, oh, I don't want to do that, oh, you should do this, no, I don't want to do that, then that's another crowd inside. If we have doubts, that's also a crowd inside. Is it this, is it that? But when the mind is unified and whole, we don't want anything. We have no doubts. We have no longing. Everything is already okay. If everything is already okay and we don't want anything, now this is the rest of the path, which is actually not supports and requisites, but features. And the features of the path is is that if I don't want anything, then I'm not going to kill anybody or harm anybody to get it. If I don't want anything, I'm not going to steal it. If I don't want anything, I'm not going to molest a man's wife. If I don't want anything, I'm not going to be jawboning and and, uh, maligning or complaining or telling lies or harsh uh, gossip or uh, frivolous talk because I don't want anything. So the precepts that we teach our children wind up being in fruition only when the mind is fit. But we keep telling the students, oh, you've got to have perfect sila before you can get your mind together. You'll never get the sila together until the mind is together, because the mind is the, co- is the source of the wrongdoing in the first place. Can, can I ask one more question about right effort? This is right effort, exactly. Yeah. And the right effort is just to remove the unwholesome thought from the mind right now before you ever have a chance of acting on it. So, so can, can I ask one more question about that? Um, what, what about like, uh, like I, so I start to get hungry and so some like craving arises. I start to think about like all the different foods that I want to eat. So I stop and I say like, okay, like everything's fine. I, I don't like, I, I don't need anything. There's not a problem. But eventually, you know, I still do need to eat. So how do I balance like the necessity of actually acting on that without like giving into the proliferation of desire? Well, you already have a routine around eating. All right, so you can follow that routine happily. The, the question that you ask is actually making problems that don't actually exist. That if you have a thought of food, you can say, well, I'm OK right now. I'll survive for the next hour or two. I'm OK. And if you have actually hungry feelings or hungry pain, the, the kind of thought that you can have is, is that, well, I can handle that. That's just a little bit of hunger. It, I mean, I just ate yesterday. I'm not on the brink of starvation. And so we begin to take a higher level perspective. You're OK right now, even though you're not eating. You'll eat later. Everything will be all right. Enjoy your food when you get it. You don't have to think about it now, wanting it, wanting something that you don't have. If you're sitting there in the meditation hall wanting to uh, to eat lunch, you're not meditating. You're wasting your time. You're in suffering. Wait, wait to eat when the food is ready, when the uh, the time is right. This is actually a major teaching for the monks of learning to eat once a day. 
going to eat twice a day. But we don't need to eat three or four times a day, and we don't need to snack. That's just something that's part of our culture. In fact, big business wants you to eat. They want you to snack. They want you to satisfy your hunger by buying their products and making the guy who is hungry for money richer. Guess what? The more money he has does not make him feel better. No matter how much money Kellogg has, he wants more. No matter how much money Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk have, they want more. So that's the way of food and hunger is, is that we always want and want and want. Now is the time to practice I'm satisfied, even though the belly has hunger in it. Even though there is a sensation there, I don't have to hate that sensation. I can inspect it. I can investigate it. I can recognize it. In fact, the feeling of hunger is the same uh, kind of situation is, is that now the body has to draw this nourishment out of the stored energy. In other words, we are no longer charging the battery. Now the battery is discharging. Well, that's a normal function. It's a normal function for people to go around being hungry. It's actually a good thing. Food tastes better if you've been hungry for a while. And so when you begin to see hunger as a friend rather than an enemy to got rid of, now we can be okay. I'm all right. I'm, yeah, so I'm hungry. So what? I'm bigger than that hunger. I can handle that. I can wait until lunchtime. Yeah. No big deal here. So these are the wholesome thoughts as opposed to unwholesome thoughts. Oh, poor me, I'm so hungry and I got to wait for another hour and let me think about what to And they won't even serve me to find the stuff that I want. I want a hamburger. I want to leave this meditation retreat and go to McDonald's. Yeah. These are the kind of thoughts that we have and all of those are unwholesome. And, and the whole point about uh, sitting down for meditation is beginning to see the mind works like this so that you can begin to control it. That literally everything about the teachings of the Buddha has to do with control. That you learn to control the breathing with long, deep in breaths. You can learn to control the mind by putting what kind of thoughts that you want in there. You learn to control the attitude by uh, fostering the right attitude. But the Mahasi method is is more a passive practice. Yeah. To just sit there and watch. Yeah. You watch the breath. No, we don't watch the breath. We learn to control the breath. If we can control the breath by controlling the mind, then that gives us the possibility and the tools and the skills we need to learn to control how we feel. Because mostly our feelings are out of control. Yeah. For instance, when hunger comes, we don't like it. We can learn to control the way that we feel, and the way that we do that is by talking ourselves into feeling the way that we want to feel. Here's a question for you. If you could choose to feel the way that you wanted to feel, how would you feel? Good, happy, joyful. All right, so start doing that. Start practicing yeah. feeling the way that you want to feel. Yeah, no, you've, you've definitely given me a lot to, to explore and a lot to play with here. Excellent. Well, this is a good um, ending point now of uh, finishing this off. I think you've got a, a, a new focus or a new way yeah. of, of practicing. Definitely. That instead of noting dukkha and then noting more dukkha, we note the dukkha. Out you go. Bye. Yeah. The Buddha had a phrase for this, and that phrase was, aha, I see you, Mara. Right. Aha, I see that thought. Oh, yeah, I think almost the most important thing is that, like there's there's ways in which that's that sort of become habit automatically just from the wearing out of it. But I feel like what what I've taken from this is that like now I can like just notice it in all areas and then be more proactive about finding what's well, what's the, the the new script, you know, instead of just accepting it until the new habit pops up spontaneously. <laughs> that's really great. Andrew, I'm really glad to meet you. Yeah, when are you going to call again? Um, oh, I don't know. Uh, when, when do you have a suggestion? Well, I would suggest uh, twice a week to once a week okay. in that time period. Okay. Not every day and not every and uh, two or three months, but call often because this stuff has to be repeated over and over and over again 
the teaching of the Buddha is small, but it is long lasting in the sense of we keep doing the same thing over and over again. I use music as an example of that, and I often use Beethoven's Fifth Symphony because actually the entire first movement of Beethoven's first Fifth Symphony is only four notes. It's only four notes long. Da 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 da. But they repeat it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And the whole symphony comes out of just those four notes. Da 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 da. Okay, so that's the whole point. All right, so the Buddha's teaching is that way too. Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda, Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda, Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda. Every time that Dukkha comes up, we swat it down. Repetition over and over and over again. Yeah, and eventually it weakens, but it doesn't weaken the beginning. It gets stronger, in fact, that we have to keep vigilant to keep throwing the stuff out rather than getting discouraged. Because the discouragement is just another unwholesome thought. Oh, poor me. Oh, I'm a victim of my own bad habits. Rather than, hey, I can handle that. I can come out of that. Now, this is not a po- this is not an affirmation. This is a reality. Yes. Affirmations are trying to get something that you don't have. What we're doing actually here is recognizing what's real. Right. This is a reality based thing. The reality is, is that you can handle hunger. You've been doing it for your whole life. So why do you make yourself miserable while you are handling it? You can be happy while you're handling it. <laughs> yeah. Well, good, Andrew. We'll see you in the next couple of days then. Sounds good. Do you have any questions before we go? No, I think, no. yeah, I think I've got plenty to investigate here. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we'll see you soon. Thank you.